Good morning, brother. So, Sunday, continuing on in uh, in John 21 there, I get to very famous uh, verse 15 to 17. And, uh, of course, I just intend to you know, steal from another thief today. And, uh, just give some reflections on on what I heard um, times even maybe word for word from Sunday while I was serving in church hearing the preaching of God's Word um, as you know it's a famous passage Peter's asked three times the same question and now I know that that the tendency here and often is uh, is done where, where <clears throat> this passage is one of those go to the Greek passages. Um, you know my position on the, the, the King James very well. I'm King James only. Um, I, I, I will often look to uh, the underlying Greek, because I don't deny the Greek and the Hebrew as being the Word of God, as was as was spoken and recorded at that time. Of course, I uh, go there sometimes, and I see definitions of words, and it gives me clarity sometimes. But I've yet to find anything in going back to the Greek that. Uh, that wasn't already there in my English Bible, and maybe I had just missed it. Uh, a pastor reminded me that uh, the context is always greater than the definition of words. This is why I'm often leery of the of the the Greek scholars. And as we readily admit one to another, those that are honest students of the Bible are essentially few and far between when it comes to the original language guys. Uh, usually we're looking, we're, we're, we're noticing men go to uh, find opportunity to change rather than find opportunity to clarify what we have in our English text. And, and seeing as the scholars are so few and seeing as those that are native to those tongues are even fewer, King James only seems to be the best route these days it's an every word Bible and we don't need to go back and forth long about this but here's another passage where <clears throat> it's often that men will go back to the Greek and say oh look Jesus asked do you do you agape me do you agape me do you phileo me usually the teaching I've heard is that Jesus says do you love me with that that deep and passionate meaningful love do you love me with that intense and and an awesome godly love and then when Peter answers twice not according to the satisfaction of Christ ultimately Jesus says all right well do you love me as one of your homies do you love me as a brother do you love me like you can give me a shot on the shoulder and and, and be there for me when I need you <laughs> But I like my King James Bible where it, it clearly says, love, do you love, do you love? And then it says, he answered him, the th he asked him the third time. Or Peter is grieved that he asked him the third time. So my English Bible, and I didn't see an italic there on the third or in that sentence. The English Bible says love was asked three times. And I don't know. I don't know how that works in the in the Greek, but he certainly didn't ask the same thing three times. So I guess that'll be a mystery, but all the same, let's look at the context to find out what the passage really means. I know that Jesus came to Simon by that name three times in the scriptures. Uh, if I look quickly, we have uh, Luke 5.4. Matthew 16, 17 maybe, um, and Luke 21, 31. Uh, these three times, Peter addresses Simon by that name Simon. 
And we know that Peter was na later named Rock, is his spiritual word. Now are called Peter, for on this, this rock I shall build my church, and the gates of hell shall not stand against it, as he, as he highlighted both Simon's profession, but also his ascension to the, the new name, as it, as it were. I don't know if these guys got their new name in advance or how that works, but we know Saul became Paul. We know we know Abram became Abraham. We know we know um, we know that uh, now we have Simon becoming Peter, as a spiritual birth is signified, perhaps. But he addresses him as Simon three times in the earlier narratives. Um, Simon, Simon, the, Satan has desired to sift thee as wheat, um, it being one of them. I believe at this time he's addressing Simon as a man. He's addressing Simon's humanity and bringing something very human in Simon to light. Now, a lot of times, as, as the previous passage, we like to take these these portions of scriptures and look at a defeated downtrodden um, group of disciples and now here's Peter he's he's getting his comeuffins right now I believe yes Jesus is bringing to light the shortcomings of Simon surnamed Peter at this time he's saying Simon Simon you got this humanity on you and these human moments you had in the last three years and I, I want to address them and obviously the most recent one in all of our memories here is when you denied me thrice there's significance to him asking three times as he denied three times but notice also I think there's significance to him asking three times addressing Simon in order to give him opportunity to affirm him three times and to come to grips with the three previous times that he addressed him in his human state. So remember another time, Peter making these bold statements, they'll all be offended, yet I won't. So Jesus brings some things to recollection. He had stood before the disciples at that time and said, they'll all be offended. <laughs> I looked around the room and, and here's some of the greatest Christians that ever lived. They walked and served uh, and, and ministered and, and learned under Jesus. And they're looking at one another. He's all means all guys. He's talking about us. So Peter makes this bold statement thinking he's, he's reached a level at that time. Now we have the seashore encounter. Simon jumps ship, swims to the Lord, forgetting what he left behind. And so immediately the question always is, is raised when he says, do you love me? You agape me, I guess. Do you love me? You agape me. Do you love me? Do you phileo me? Asked him these three times. In the context, I think Jesus is just asking, do you fully and totally love me? Is there a complete love for me? Do you have that great godly love for me? Do you have that love for me as a friend? Do you love me fully and completely more than these? What are the these? That question always comes up, of course. Is it the fishes? Peter, do you love me more than these fish? Do you love me more than this hot meal? Do you love me more than, than this, this job that you have, right? Because quite often it's taught that Peter was defeated and so he was going to go back to his day job. You know what? I'm done with this preaching thing. I'm going to go back to fishing. We know that that was not what was happening in the verses previous, as we've discussed already. We know that actually when Peter was called, he forsook all. 
He left the nets, he left the boat, and here again when he sees Christ in the seashore, after going for his little adventure fishing with the boys, maybe for the last time, he leaves those things again. So I don't think Jesus is asking, do you love me more than these boats and these net and this tackle and these fishes? No. <sighs> he's... He's saying, Peter, do you... Let's, let's go back to these these human moments you've had. You remember not too long saying, though I'll be offended, yet will not I? And I had to say to you, hey, for the cock crows, thou shalt deny me thrice. Let me ask you these three times the same question. Do you love me fully, completely? And let me point at a specific moment in time where you stood before these same men we're standing before now. Do you love me more than these men? Are you going to make that same brash statement? Are you going to claim superiority again? Are you less human than these? Are you sure you're not susceptible to falling into them Simon moments? There, Peter. This is a great act of mercy. Jesus here is not rubbing his nose in it. Ha! You said you wouldn't deny me three times, eh? Huh? How do you like it now? I told you so. Are you so big and bad? No. In this act of mercy and grace, Jesus is giving Peter opportunity to make up for the three times he denied by affirming Christ three times and publicly. To make up for the times when he, yeah, in his pride and arrogance, that human moment there claimed superiority over his brothers and his presence. He's giving opportunity to face that thing and, and get over it. You gotta wonder what kind of tension there might have been. They all heard him say those great claims and they all probably knew at this moment that he denied. And that might have been something that stunk up his ministry from that day forward where Jesus not to extend an opportunity to get it right. And that is a merciful thing of our God, giving us opportunity to face our human moments, opportunity to face our sins and our transgressions and deal with them. And sometimes even in front of the people that we committed them before in the first place. My pastor brought up a statement his pastor friend has had said before and, and it stuck with him. Now we as Christians like to buy our sins at retail and then sell them at wholesale, don't we? We go about our day, we go, go about our lives, ooh, pick up that sin, ooh, grab all of this sin, ooh, do a little of that sin, ooh, pick up some of this sin, and we hit the checkout and we walk away with them. One by one by one by one, we gather up sins and then sadly we go to our prayer closet and we try to wholesale these off to Jesus. Or we or we lay in bed and from our pillows say something along the lines of, Oh dear Lord, forgive me all my sins and all the transgressions I did today. Amen. <laughs> we buy up our sins at retail and we sell them off at, at wholesale. At least we try to. But here Peter learns that, you know, sometimes it's better and... and and more lasting to address these things in the same way you received them. <laughs> Jesus addresses Simon, lovest thou me more than these? You want to make that bold statement again? Come on, let's deal with these. So Jesus gently brings Peter back to those moments in a wonderful act of, of mercy and forgiveness to him. You know, the Bible says, if ye be without chastisement, whereof all are partakers, then are ye bastards and no sons. 
actually one of the signs of our sonship is that chastisement enters into our life. And so don't get all mad at God when he corrects you from time to time and brings you to a moment where you're very human before him. That's his mercy. That's him reminding you he cares enough to correct you. I have to tell my son, look, son, if daddy didn't love you, he would let you get away with these things. If daddy hated you, there would be no consequence. But because daddy loves you and he wants you to do well and he wants you to to grow up to be a, a, a wonderful servant of our Lord Jesus, because that's the case, I love you and I care about you, I correct you, son. I remind you that I love you because I correct you. And I know it doesn't seem that way, but it's for your best. And in mercy and in love and in grace, Jesus does the same to his sons. He brings him back to this moment. And and I believe this is why. Jesus has this question, do you love me completely, fully? Do you agape, do you phileo me, both in one and the same? Because he asked them, the same question three times. Do you love me? Do you love me? Do you love me? Peter says, Lord, you know all things. Of course you know I love you. He says, well, feed my sheep and we'll get there. It's not an embarrassment thing. It's not an I told you so. It's not It's not to, to drag his nose in his own mess. But I believe here Jesus... Perhaps he knew there was a little bit of bitterness, a little bit of disappointment in himself. Perhaps he knew there was a little bit of contention amongst the disciples. Perhaps he knew that down the line where this not dealt with and dealt with right and dealt with before the Lord and dealt with before those people that he had sinned against. When he claimed he would never deny and did. Jesus wanted to remind Peter of his own wonderful grace. In his own wonderful grace that was over was able to overcome the human moments of Simon and to bring Peter forward in this this path of life and in the path of his calling that he was about to enter into. Peter, I'm able to overcome by my wonderful grace your pride, your flesh, your tongue. I'm able to overcome these. Do you love me? See, us with our retribution mindset, we think Jesus is now, ha! He's going to stick it to him. He's going to embarrass him in front of his disciples and and make Peter get this thing right. You love me. Do you love me? Oh, fine. You don't love me with that great love, then I I guess I will settle for brotherly love. No, he asked him three times, do you fully, completely love me in this act of grace? It's not Jesus making retribution and trying to crush Peter in front of him. It's, It's Jesus trying to show the heart of the Lord, which actually wants to show love towards his creation, especially his new creation. Believer, do you know that Jesus loves you? In spite of all your sins past, and in spite of all your sins more recently, and in spite of all the sins you'll commit in the future, It's the Lord's heart to love you in spite of all these things. Sometimes bringing you to face your sins is only so he can get another opportunity to remind you he's forgiven you of all your sins. Because otherwise we have the tendency to carry them with us, don't we? And that analogy of buying our sins wholesale, when we're going through the shop, don't we buy a lot of extra things that we don't need? extra junk we keep with us. We never use it for its intended purpose. We drag baggage along with us. It's like we drag sins along with us. We expect to get rid of them wholesale. Some go and we can forgive even ourselves of them. But there's some that are a little heavier. 
So Jesus helps us out, brings us to face them so that we can let go of them, sell them off, give them to Jesus to cover as he already has done. Reminder, I've forgiven you that sin, Peter, when you denied me three times. Have you forgiven yourself, Peter? You denied me three times. You said I don't know him. You said you don't know me. I knew you. Remember when we made eye contact? You remember how you felt, Peter? I loved you even then. I loved you so much. I don't need to, but I would give my life again for you, and again for you, and again for you. But once was enough for all. Peter, I love you. Do you love me? See, Peter, of course, had this outward embarrassment for denying the Lord three times. But Jesus saw past that even and saw a heart that was wounded as a result of it. And he also saw beyond that and he saw the future that might have been hindered as a result of it. And so in his grace and his mercy, he says, Peter, here's your opportunity. You denied me three times. Let's get it right three times and confess me three times. Heal your hurts and the hurts of your brethren here. We're often more concerned with the outward embarrassment when we try to suppress the heart hurt that is there. And yet Jesus reminds us, reminds Peter, hey Peter, here's where you messed up. Remember all the times I've called you Peter in your ministry? You know how human you are. You know you're prone to wander, prone to leave the God you love. You, you denied me openly after making these, oh, Peter, ridiculous statements before your brethren. I'll never deny you. I'll follow you to the death. I'll even go to prison. Peter, you know where you messed up. I loved you and forgave you. Remember? As far as the east is from the west, so far hath the Lord for, for forgiven you all your sins. You remember that? Peter, you messed up. I still love you. I forgave you. Peter, do you love me back? Do you fully love me? And this is ultimately what the Lord wants. We sit there and we're wrecked and for our sins remove ourselves from the presence of God and we get downtrodden and we get defeated. We need to remind ourselves as Jesus here is doing towards his beloved disciple, I've forgiven you. Do you love me? Christian, you're forgiven. You love God. Love Him. Love Him. He loves you. Right now, you've got a level of understanding of what it means to love God. And you know what? 50 years from now, you'll have a more intense love. Think of marriages. I don't know if you've ever known, but my grandparents, my wife, on my wife's side, they were married 60 years. And they had a way of... of, of winking at one another, a touch of the hand, walking one with another, talking to one with another. When they said, I love you, sometimes it didn't even need to be with words. It needed to be a wink. It was enough to see a connection between those two. You think when those two say, I love you one to another, it means more than it does for the newlyweds? If you've been married 10 years, you think your love has reached a level of understanding and depth that would match somebody married for 60 years? 
Same goes for walking with the Lord. You just meet the Lord. You're so full of the love of God and, and that, that tickles and warms your heart. Do you think that love's going to grow deeper for him as time goes on? As you're brought to these moments of, of failure and then grace reapplied? As, as you walk with him and you learn to understand who he is and, and, and what he has done for you, you think your love's going to grow deeper? Jesus knows this too. And so I believe Peter's love for Jesus in this moment when he says, Yea, Lord, I love you. You know I love you. Jesus is like, yeah, yeah. Peter, I know you love me. But I think Jesus also acknowledged that the Peter in Second Peter versus the Peter now had a different love one for another. Go read First and Second Peter and see the tenderness that is entered into the heart of this hardened fisherman that came out and brashly said, No, I'll deny you. I will never deny you. Jesus says, do you love me? And Peter says, yea, Lord, you know us to all things. Yea, Lord, look at my heart. You know I love you. But the great thing, and I got to wrap this up quick. I'm out of time. Is Peter draws the attention of Jesus to his heart. Jesus, you know my heart. You know I love you. Do you know what we try to do? Well, if you love him, keep his commandments. We try to take a man's conduct and apply it to whether or not he loves the Lord. Now, who would you rather take? And I've talked about this at length. Give me the man whose conduct isn't quite up to standards, but has a great love for God and the things of God over the man that has standards nailed down to a T, looks the part, walks the t part, talks the part, but is a hypocrite in his own heart. And Peter says, look, Jesus, never mind my conduct. You know I love you. And Jesus says, yeah, Peter, I know your heart and I know that you love me. And then he says this, feed my sheep. Be reminded, Christian, that Jesus loves you in spite of your conduct. Know in your heart you love God. Express your love for him best you know how at this moment. Whether it's the love of newlyweds or you're a seasoned Christian. And your love has grown far beyond. But watch this. Do you love me, he says. Do you love me? Do you love me? Yea, Lord, you know I love you. Well, then feed my sheep. He says, let the love for me be what launches your ministry. You notice that? Do you love me? Well, then serve. Too often we get it backwards. Oh, I serve because I love people. That'll only last so long. People will hurt. People will harm. People will let you down. People won't give you the type of grace and mercy and, and care and love that Jesus is now showing to Peter. So he says, Peter, of course I know you love me. I know your heart. Let your love for me be what leads you into the ministry. Be what motivates you into ministering. Let your love for me be the momentum that brings you to love others. Serve others. Not for yourself, not for others, but because you love me. I love you, Peter. Jesus loves each and every one of us. You know what? He does so in spite of our conduct. And sometimes he brings us to face our conduct only so he can remind us again of the great love, grace, and mercy he has for us. Amen. Praise the Lord for that.